Shalom, Haverim. Hi, friends. How are you? Welcome to Raising Jewish Kids, the place to have deep and meaningful, meaningful conversations. It's a place for parents and for educators, and we will talk about very special things today. We have an amazing guest. I am Evelyn Goldfinger, aka Miss Eve. So happy to see you all. I'm a cantorial soloist, an author, a Jewish educator, a performer, and my mission is to empower and inspire children, educators, and families in Jewish traditions and values and spirituality, and I do that through my shows, my workshops, my um, books, and my videos on YouTube channel at Torotron. So today's conversation, we have a very special guest. Her name is Sara Aroeste. And she will be talking about Latino heritage and how to model for children being proud of our traditions. Which is such it is such a current topic, and I'm so excited to have her. She's absolutely magnificent, and I will share with you more about her in a minute. This conversation today is very dear and special to me because it's dedicated to the loving memory of my grandmother, Bobe Ana Roymisar, aka Chola, Sichronali Brachale Lunishmat. Hana in the Bat Aron Bechava. And today would have been her birthday. She she left us a year ago, um, this week in the uh, daily calendar, the Gregorian calendar. And we miss her so much. And she was very passionate about traditions. And especially she loved a song that I used to sing in Ladino. And um, it's, so it's very special to have Sarah today talking about Ladino and Judaism and Judeo Espanol with all of us, which is such an important part of uh, Jewish heritage. So uh, this conversation is brought to you by my new book, Words from My Heart, the Hands on Jewish Prayer Book that empowers children and their families and their educators to explore and discover spirituality in a hands-on, practical, fun way. You can learn more about it at shalomeve.com. Oh, wait, I forgot. I have the second proof copy right here. And it's just fantastic. It's, it's full with exercises, games, and uh, the opportunity for kids also to write their own prayers from their heart, uh, illustrations, colors. More about it at shalomeve.com. All right, are we ready? I'm so happy to introduce you to Sara Aroeste. Inspired by her family's roots in North Macedonia and Greece, Sara Aroeste is determined to bring Sephardic culture to new generations. Since 2001, Aroeste has toured the globe, presenting traditional and original Ladino songs with her unique blend of Balkan sounds, pop and jazz. She has recorded eight albums, including the first ever all original Ladino children's album, Hora de Despertar, the first bilingual Ladino English holiday album, Together in Juntos, and the award-winning Monastir, an international musical tribute to a once thriving Balkan Jewish community. In 2014, she won the Sephardic Prize at the International Jewish Music Festival in Amsterdam. And in 2015, she represented the USA in the International Sephardic Music Festival in Cordoba, Spain. Sara is, current, is currently co-directing her newest initiative, Savor, a Sephardic music and food experience. All right, I'm going to stop talking about her. She's absolutely amazing. You've heard her introduction, anything from singing to writing books and children's books and her music for all ages and the awards. But you know what? Let's invite her. Let's welcome Sara. Oh, so excited that you're here, Sara. Welcome. <laughs> it's so here. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. How how do we say welcome or hi or what what would we use in, in Ladino? Oh, there are so many ways. I actually have a whole song about it. <laughs> so I teach my kids to say Que haber shalom bonjour, buenos dias, oh boy run. <laughs> so whenever we see people now they always hum that <laughs> everywhere they go. That's fantastic. Okay, could you shorten us and without like the, the tune so that we can repeat after you? Okay, sure. So, um, que haber. Que haber. Salom. Salom. Bonjour. Bonjour. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Or boyrun. Or boyrun. Yeah, boyrun is Turkish for welcome. <laughs> oh my gosh, all these amazing, do you understand that like, this had a combination of 
Hebrew, Spanish, yeah. French, Turkish. Yeah, that's the of of Ladino. It's this incredible, rich. It's not just a language, but I'll start with the language, which is to say that it is different than Yiddish in that, you know, a lot of people think Ladino is uh, the equivalent, like Yiddish is German and Hebrew. People think that Ladino is Spanish and Hebrew. It's not. It's so much more than that. <laughs> it's Castilian Spanish at its core, but it also mixes bits and pieces of a lot of different languages from the countries that influenced the exiled Jews as they left Spain and went towards the east, towards the Ottoman Empire. They picked up bits of Portuguese, Italian, French, Arabic, Greek, Turkish, and of course Hebrew. But it really is this incredible sort of pan Mediterranean language that is just beautiful to speak, to to hear, to sing. Um, if only more people knew about it. <laughs> and this is exactly where you come in. Um, so before we dive in, I've I've learned through my uh, Ladino exposure, Ladino is actually the culture. It's Judesmo or Judeo Espanol, the name of the language. Is that correct? When we're talking about Latino, we're usually technically referring to much more than just uh, a language, right? For me, that's true. That, you know, at its core, we're, it's a language, but it represents this larger, wider culture of the Sephardic, the Ottoman Sephardic experience. But um, you were right to pick up on the fact that there are different names for this language and it, it's become sort of a semantics issue. Some people very much prefer the um, the term Judeo Espanol, um, Judeo, um, well, my, my own grandfather just called it uh, Spanol, period, just Spanol. Um, some people call it Judeo, Desmo, um, there are variations in the terms, um, and they are actually um, different ways of looking at this language um, and, and culture, but for sort of popular purposes, it's become the norm to call all of what we're talking about Ladino. Okay, great. Now that we have that clear, everybody, we know where we're standing. And if you hear me pronounce it a little bit super well <laughs> it's because i'm from argentina spanish is my first language and ladino has a lot of spanish in it and the pronunciation it sometimes is very close so i'm completely like i have an advantage of you don't be although you know what i sometimes tell spanish speakers that they're often actually at a disadvantage because they're so used to pronouncing things in certain ways and you know for example they're one of my favorite songs that i teach is called hija mia but Spanish speakers are always like, wait, you're pronouncing it wrong, right? Because you wouldn't say hija with the or the J, you would say hija, right? So actually for some Spanish uh, speakers, it's a little bit you know, like- that, that, that is so right and so interesting. I, I have another advantage to my favor, which is that one of my best friends growing up, her family is from Rodas from Greece. Well, no, it was Greece. So I already was exposed to that pronunciation, but that's right. I have to double check, you know, when we got sing the candelitas, it's cinco, it's not cinco. But still, you know, it's like pretty, pretty close. And, you know, in fact, that's also um, more of a Bosnian pronunciation. So even within Ladino, we have different pronunciations depending on where you ended up. So my family ended up in what is today North Macedonia. At the time, it was all part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, uh, so the story I often tell is growing up, my, my brain was a little, you know, fuzzy about it all because my grandfather used to tell me that he was born in Greece, but that he was a Turk and that he spoke Spanish, <laughs> which really like sums up the Ottoman Sephardic experience. But if you're, as a young kid, it was very confusing. Now, of course, it makes perfect sense. But you know, depending on where your family ended up, whether it was um, you know, in Rhodes or in Salonika or in Izmir, um, you know, or in Monastir, where my family is from, you would pronounce certain words slightly differently. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, are we celebrating, is this this month, uh, the month of uh, Sephardic heritage? Are we um, still in Mizrahi heritage, which is a great thing to point out because often Sephardim and Mizrahim are sort of put under this non-Ashkenazi umbrella together, although we are very different. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons, um, especially in Israel, there is often... Um, 
a much sort of clearer separation between Ashkenazi and everybody else who are sort of lumped together. I think in America, we're trying uh, <laughs> to sort of parse out and separate the differences um, between Sephardic and Mizrahi culture. Um, so when I speak and in my work, I really concentrate on the Sephardi experience, meaning that it is the experience of those Jews who can trace their ancestry back to Spain specifically. Thank you for, for clarifying that. I wonder if there is a, a, a Sephardic month, awareness month, because we're trying to say not everybody, not every Jew is Ashkenazi. Like that's the norm in this, at least part of the world, for some reason, because, you know, and we're trying to say, whoa, wait a second. What about this other culture, which is like millennia, right? We're not talking about 10 years of Sephardic culture, 20 or 100. We're talking about such a rich culture. I'm so excited that you're here to, to share with us and, and to clarify all those things. So do we have a month or, you know? No, I, not that I'm aware of. For me, every day is Sephardic day. So, <laughs> so it's kind of irrelevant for, for me, but uh, um, one specific month, I don't think we do. I, I think we should definitely put it out there. If like the people of the calendar, the Jewish calendar is looking, <laughs> we're inviting you to consider. I mean, we definitely have, you know, Jewish Heritage Month and um, we've just had um, Mizrahi Heritage Month and certainly, um, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month. I sort of piggyback on that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I find ways throughout the year. Of course, of course you do. And thinking about you find the ways, how did you find your way into Latino culture and being an ambassador? Because I think that's what you are, such a great ambassador of Latino culture nowadays. So tell us, share it with us. You know, I actually don't think my story is that unique in that um, I grew up in a family that um, had a very proud Sephardic heritage, but it was very internal. It was really um, something that we celebrated within the house, um, within our own family, especially around holidays. Um, but that outwardly, you know, wasn't something that as a, you know, young tween that I would talk about with my friends, but I was very aware that I was one of, you know, two or three Sephardic households in our, in our local synagogue. But my family came to America escaping war. Um, in their case, it was the Balkan Wars, which is not really a war that we talk about that much in the United States. But, you know, certainly um, 1912, 1913 was a major shift in demography um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there was a huge influx of, um, of immigrants, not only to the United States, but also to Israel, to South America, from the Sephardic population. It's when the Turkish Empire fell. Um, so my family left during the Balkan Wars and came to the United States. And for them, you know, it's such a typical story. They were escaping war. They sort of left the old country behind and they wanted to assimilate as quickly as possible and become American. So, you know, a lot of the really unique traditions did not get passed on. So, um, the language was sort of the first to go because when my grandfather was a, a young boy in America, he had to speak English to get by in, in school. Um, so I always heard Ladino spoken among the, um, the older generations, but it was kind of in private and it wasn't something that they, you know, that they wanted to share with, um, with my mom's generation or with me. Um, but I heard snippets here and there, whether it was you know, my great aunts in the kitchen making barrecas and, you know, chitter chattering um, or through a couple of songs that got trickled down. And I was just so fascinated by it. And at the same time, I was so frustrated because I wanted to know more. And I sort of felt like I had to fight to learn about my culture. And um, uh, it didn't get me very far, I have to admit. <laughs> But then I really found my way through music. For me, that was my, um, you know, really my medium. I grew up as a very serious classical Western musician. Um, I did piano, I did violin, um, and mostly voice. And for a long time, I actually thought I was going to be an opera singer. And that took me to Israel. I was, um, as a to young adults, I was maybe 20 years old, um, I was invited to sing at the Israel Vocal Arts Institute, which is sort of like um, a summer festival of the Tel Aviv Opera, it's sort of a feeding ground. And it was an incredible experience because obviously the opera singing was amazing and just being in Israel was like 
wow, it was a combination of so many things that I loved. But I was paired just coincidentally as my opera coach, I was paired with the late, great Nico Castell, um, who not only was he an incredible opera singer and um, he was a opera coach at the Metropolitan Opera. He had an incredible career, but he was also a Hazan, a Sephardic Hazan. And he was one of the first um, uh, people, at least in America, through Tara Publications to publish an accessible Ladino songbook, which, you know, because Ladino was an oral tradition for so long, a lot of the songs had been sort of stuck, not stuck, but had been only available in academia and through certain library archives and um, listservs. But, you know, the sort of advent of the popular songbook, um, he was sort of one of the first in America. And um, to discover that we shared this same Sephardic background was just an incredible coincidence. And so in between our opera coachings, he would actually teach me some of the very you know, traditional classical Ladino repertoire, which I had not known growing up. And I just I fell in love with it. And that was sort of like my aha moment because I started incorporating in my opera recitals little portions of Ladino songs. Um, and without fail, after you know, every performance, audience members would come up to me and tell me that the Ladino songs were their favorite. <laughs> parts of the program and you know it took a second for that light bulb to kind of go off but then I realized oh my gosh they're right I must be singing the music in a different way for it to reach the audience more than let's say Mozart <laughs> I mean no offense to Mozart I love singing Mozart but um, I think my heart and my soul was singing the Ladino music in such a different way and you know it wasn't an instant thing it took me a couple of years to really you know understand what that meant for me career wise, because I always thought, oh my gosh, it's opera or nothing. I didn't know that there was another option for me. Um, you know, nobody had ever started a Ladino rock band before. So I was like, wait, I could do this. Um, and so it took me some time. And um, I have a, I grew up with a single mother. And so um, about a year or two later, when I decided to go for it, you know, here I was 22 years old. And I told my, my poor single mom, mom, I want to start a Ladino rock band. And <laughs> you can imagine she was not too, not too pleased. Um, but you know, over 20 years later, <laughs> here I am. So um, it, I guess it all worked out. Fantastic! It, it was the shirt. I, I don't know what would be the equivalent in maybe yeah. to, <laughs> in, in Ladino, but it was like so meant to be, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it wasn't an easy path for you, uh, or maybe it was. Maybe <laughs> oh, it's still an uphill battle because you know most people have never even heard of Ladino. You ask the average, even you know American Jew, they've they've never even heard of Ladino. So you know half the challenge is just getting people to know that there are other Jewish languages besides Hebrew and Yiddish. And oh my gosh, there's so many more than just Ladino Hebrew and Yiddish. I mean, there are, there are so many dozens and dozens of languages. Um, there's a great organization called the Jewish Language Project that helps promote other um, Jewish languages. But, you know, it, there, there's such a wealth of Jewish diversity and we just don't talk about it enough. We're so stuck in this sort of Ashkenormative pattern. Um, and really what I do in my work day in, day out is just to open people's minds that there's so much more to Jewish culture than that. Um, and I think you mentioned my uh, 2016 album. It was a children's album, but it was very purposefully titled. It's called Hora de Despertar, which means time to wake up. And the title track is literally a morning song about everything we do to wake up from, you know, brushing your teeth to tying your shoes to, you know, eating breakfast, all of that. But I really wrote that album in many ways for an older audience to sort of the, you know, for them to hook on to that message, it's time to wake up. We have to teach these traditions to our children before it's too late. So, you know, that mantra, you know, has stuck with me through all of my projects over the last two decades. Hora de despertar. We all have to wake up and, and you know, do be responsible and, and do what we all need to do to pass this tradition. And not just the Sephardic tradition, but all of these Jewish traditions onto our kids.
you're touching on so many great points. One being the fact that we do need to talk more about the diversity of Judaism and of Jewish people. Uh, and it's not only because we're diverse because of the people who choose to join the tribe, but also because of our story. We're talking about a people who's like thousands of years old. Of course, we, it makes sense. And we, we, you know, we were in the diaspora. We, many of us were expelled from our land. So it makes sense that our journey is very diverse. And it does make sense also that culturally, we are so rich because we, we created little melting pots, like moving melting pots here and there, right? So it's, uh, it's, I think it's so important to teach us. And I, I thank you, you know, of all you know, parents and educators for your work because I think it's, it's amazing. And like you said, I, I don't imagine many 22 years old, 20 years ago, female saying, hey, I'm going to be, you know, I'm gonna wear this as my, my, my flag. I'm gonna be a Ladino speaker and performer and and by the way this is this is how, how i make my living right <laughs> by the way. and i'm an artist already so you're an artist a jewish artist and then you're doing the video so it's niche 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 <laughs> I mean, and I always tell people from the start, I'm not doing this to become rich and famous because that's a losing battle, right? I mean, you have to really love your culture <laughs> to want to, you know, to want to make it your career. But I, I often tell people it's like not a choice. I just, what I'm called to do and however, you know, that means to you. I mean, it sounds so cliche, but, but, but truly, and you know, there's, um, I, I often talk about this one um, image that I grew up with, which is that um, while my family was born in Monastir, our sort of sister city, we also had a lot of family in Salonika, um, which is in neighboring Greece. And um, Salonika was one of the hardest hit cities along with Monastir in terms of the percentage of Jews murdered in World War II. In fact, Monastir, where my grandfather was from, had the highest percentage. 98% of the Jewish population was exterminated. I mean, 98%. We don't talk about the Sephardic experience in the Holocaust, but I mean, that's one of the primary reasons why so few people speak Ladino today and why so few people you know, know about us today, because it's, it's a sheer number game. Our, we lost a huge percentage of our population with that, an entire culture. But Salonika, the entire city was raised, I mean, absolutely burnt to the ground, except for one synagogue that was left standing because the Nazis used it as a Red Cross shelter. And um, it still exists today. And on the facade of the building, it, it actually says it's built by the Monastirli community, Monastir, our, our town, um, by an Itzhak Aroesti. So literally, like... Everything was destroyed except this one synagogue that bears my family name. And so growing up with that knowledge, it's like it's a huge responsibility knowing that, you know, there aren't enough people left to tell these stories. I feel like I have to. Otherwise, this tradition is going to die out. And so I have carried with I've carried that with me throughout my career. And so it really just it doesn't feel like a choice for me. This is you know I have to do it. You you gave me over my goosebumps already once when you <laughs> yeah because first of all you said about this whole city which was wide up or and almost and then the story about uh, uh your your ancestor there with the synagogue and and it's just give me just we have some people live and we do have a question i will address that in a minute so and thank you everybody who is joining us live whether it's for the whole program or a little bit and you will come back to it we know it's the middle of the day um this will be recorded and, and afterwards will be posted. I wanted to ask you, Sarah, what was your experience when you first visited, whether it was Spain or Monastir or maybe it was different, like the very first time you went there? Because I imagine it was after your trip to Israel or maybe if it yeah. was. I've been to Israel so many times. I actually lived in Israel for a few years um, uh, during and after college. So my first real experience with my Sephardic culture. And I'd also been to Greece and Salonika many times before then. But the first time it really like hit my soul was um, visiting Monastir for the first time, for sure. And I think that there was just so much wrapped into it um, because I was literally walking in the footsteps of my ancestors. And that is an incredibly powerful <laughs> experience. I mean, I have photographs of 
places where my ancestors were and then to actually go to those places and and visit them and you know houses where my cousin lived who's still alive she's 105 years old um and so to sit on the balcony of her house i mean so that was powerful and i have to say one of the reasons why it's so powerful and especially today with so much you know anti-semitism and misinformation and to have allies in this world and especially in this work is so important. And one of the reasons why I love Monastir so much, its um, modern name is Bitola, is because there are no Jews left. There are no Jews left in Bitola. After World War II, after 98% was exterminated, there have been, there's been no Jewish community left. And yet the history is being preserved by the non-Jews there who love our history and have loved knowing that we're part of their own national identity and want it back. And so I have been constantly, I mean, to be impressed is not the right word, just bowled over by the love shown to me by this non-Jewish Muslim Christian population that understands that when the Jews were taken, they lost a bit of themselves too. And, and they have worked really hard to bring that history back. And they've only been so welcoming to me and my family's story. And it's why I continue to visit as, you know, as many times as I can. And it's a story, you know, when there's so much hatred in this world, like that is a love affair that is just, I mean, I wish everybody knew about it. It's the most amazing place to visit. Fantastic. Everybody get your plane tickets whenever right. you can. <laughs> I, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful experience for me. It was uh, going to Spain and Portugal. Mm -hmm. And I'm Ashkenazi, as far as I know, except for one great-grandmother whose last name was uh, something like uh, Prince. And I've read that the, the root, the shortage it will be in Hebrew, the root of that, SPR, comes from Esperanza. Mm -hmm. And that it's a common last name from Sephardic Jews, Esperanza means hope, that Tikva, that left or, or were expelled and they reached Ashkenazic, you know, dwellings and they changed their name to that. So I haven't, you know, had done any it's test, but there might be some uh, ancestry there for me. But I have my Portuguese passport through the Sephardic right of return. So um, next time I'm there, I can do some, some digging for you. But <laughs> um, yeah, so um, recent DNA studies show that upwards of like 25% of Latin America has Sephardic roots, which is unbelievable. And the, you know, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about this, especially in today's political climate. I mean, if people knew that they were chances are they're probably Sephardic and have Jewish roots, like what that could do for world peace, right? And for understanding and bridge building. So um, I think we're actually gonna, um, it's gonna become more important in, in the years to come, these, you know, DNA discoveries. I agree. And, and also I was thinking as I was walking those um, cities, and if you've been to, you know, Toledo or Cordoba or all these cities or in Portugal too, what happened was that history was there. You could see the marks of the Inquisition. We we're talking about way back, right? Um, but also, like, that was sort of the end or the end of that part. But going back to that, if you went uh, to the old city where, you know, it was closed and it was the Jewish quarter or the Jewish city there, um, you could see a whole culture going on for millennia. And this is why it's, 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 it resonates so much nowadays when we're thinking about Jewry in America and what's going on. And of course, I would say this will never happen here. But you never know, sadly, if, if you're listening and if you are, as you said, whether you're Jewish or you're an ally, an ally it's really important to speak up because mm -hmm. also... It doesn't end with the Jews. Never. It never does. When there's, you know, hate and uh, racism and extremes, it never ends there. And the world suffers. And so if you're interested in more <laughs> learning more about this culture, I invite you to do that. And I'm so grateful to Sarah for, for illuminating that. Hanukkah is approaching and Thanksgiving, so I'm thankful. And I'm also thinking about that Hanukkah light, that shamash that you are lighting bringing a light to a culture that it wasn't all about how it was over because sometimes we'll focus on that, right? But all about joy. And that is my ultimate message, which is that you can't 
get people to understand about you through anger and through, you know, I used to have a chip on my shoulder when I was starting this, when I was starting off in my career, you know, why don't you know about Ladino, right? No, 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 no. That's not the right attitude to take. We have to meet people with love and joy. And so really all my work, since I had children, I mean, it was really because of my children that I realized, okay, I need to change this logic and create a world for my kids that they, you know, that they would be proud to be Sephardic and they only see it with love and joy. And so that's why, I don't know if this is going to be backwards on the screen, but that was my first um, album for kids. And then everything since then, um, I want to create experiences for families. So um, this is a bilingual holiday album. It's English and Ladino. It circles the, the Hebrew calendar. Um, and you mentioned Hanukkah. This is one of my favorite albums, Hanukkah, which um, really was born out of the experience during COVID where I was on all of these Hanukkah Zooms and I had... I, Strangely enough, I felt the joy of Hanukkah more in the last few years than I'd felt in a couple of years prior to that, that we were all you know, watching each other on Zoom, but seeing everybody's menorahs around the world and all this like pent up joy that we wanted to express. And I realized there are so many Ladino Hanukkah songs besides Ocho Candelicas. I love Ocho Candelicas, but there's a lot more than that. So I actually put together an entire album just of Ladino Hanukkah songs. And it was one of my most joyful, um, joyful projects. And you know, for kids, I want them to see that. Also, you know, I write kids' books, I think you mentioned. So here, this is a, you know, a really just joyful story of a Shabbat family, of a Sephardic family having Shabbat. I have one coming out called Mazal Bueno. Let's celebrate all the wonderful milestones of a child's life. But, you know, let's let's throw in some Ladino, Mazal Bueno. So um, whether it is modeling for my kids the love of my own tradition, but um, but it, it all is filtered through just joy and celebration and appreciation. And it's little things too. Like, um, you know, I off, every day I wear something jewelry um, that has something Jewish. It's either, you know, a ring, a bracelet, an earring. My kids see that every day when they wake up. We have little tzedakah boxes in every room. They just see what I do every day to make sure they know um, how important my culture is, whether it's Sephardic or you know, Jewish at large. Um, it's, it's infused in everything that I do, how I look, how I decorate my house. Um, and that's what we have to do. We have to show our kids the joy of our, of our culture. That's beautiful, Sarah. And you're not only modeling it for kids, but you're also modeling for us, other fellow parents and educators, um, how to to engage children in this conversation, how to start that, that spark that will, you know, develop in, in, in questions and in stories. And um, so whatever it is that your heritage is, uh, viewer or listener, we invite you to do the same and to really take pride because when children are, find pride in their heritage and they can find the joy and the values. And because I believe that that's true for all cultures. They have like this amazing... Um, history and culture behind them and sometimes songs and languages and stories and no matter where you come from if you know your story then your identity builds with I think with a stronger self because you feel like you belong to something really beautiful and, and it's your treasure right heritage um, and and if you want to take it along the road great if you want to maybe do a sort of mix with another thing like a fiction, that's okay too but and I was also thinking, Sarah, you are such an amazing woman. When I was there in Spain, I remember, you know, going to the museum and learning all the stories about these powerful, first of all, artists. Like art was such a big part of the Jewish culture. In Ashkenazi world, we have to find out, like, it is sort of okay, I guess, to be Jewish and, and an artist in some parts. But being an artist, being a poet, and being you know um a professional of whether it was medicine or or physics or but also there were amazing women and they had such power and i believe also there were women who were artists at the time and you know uh and the role of the woman was was so beautiful back then yes and it continues today in that sephardic culture you know, it really was an oral tradition up until about the 20th century and so many of our traditions within this culture were passed down by women <laughs> so um, you know whether it was food traditions or song traditions or you know poetry even so it's it's this 
filtering through a female lens that I often look at um, a lot of Sephardic life. So I'm especially attracted to, you know, certain um, cantigas, certain folk songs that are written from the, the female point of view, which I just find really fun because it's rare in Jewish culture that we have that, that lens, but it's so prevalent in Sephardic life. It really embraces a, a female um, perspective and also the female body, which is something we don't talk about in Jewish culture at all. But some of these songs, oh my gosh, they will make you blush. <laughs> Really, like the traditional repertoire, some of the songs are very graphic um, and very, um, not in a bad way, but, you know, um, but you know, they're just, they, it, it's very um, clear how much the female body is honored and um, appreciated. And it's beautiful. Um, it's one of the things I love most about um, the part of culture. That's beautiful. So let's segue a little bit before we end into the music, because we do have a question and it's a very interesting question to address and speaking about music you know that uh when we talked about having this raising jewish kids conversation with sarah i shared with her that i i am ashkenazic and i sing i'm a i'm a cantorial soloist so but one of the songs that i used to sing my my bob is my bob Chola, who would be her birthday now she left us a year ago was abraham avino and it was you know, very well known, <laughs> almost like I would say one of the anthems of um, Sephardic culture. Um, sure. That's what I say. What it's, do you call it? It's like our Hava Nagila. <laughs> That's beautiful. So she loved it and he, she used to ask me to sing it again and again. So how special and I thank you to honor my, my grandmother, my Bobe my very Ashkenazic Bobby, with your presence, talking about Ladino, and maybe we can get a snippet of that song if you're up for it, ah. as a way to... Do you to do you know? we'll just do, we could just do the, the chorus. Avram Avinu, Padre Querido, Padre Bendicho, Luz de Israel. Avram Avinu, Padre Querido, Padre Bendicho, Luz de Israel. Oh. <laughs> I always say that I love that song because there is one uh, of the verses that says the mujer de Terach, Terach's wife. So that's a so, mother. Correct. And she doesn't have her name. Her actual name is um, Amitlai, I think. And she's never mentioned otherwise. It's really a very, I, I teach a lot about this, this one story. She was incredible when there was, um, uh, you, she wasn't supposed to be pregnant um, because all of the children were going to be taken away actually um, uh, went on her own into the middle of the woods. She didn't even tell, you know, her husband that she was going. She didn't tell Tarek. She went and she gave birth all by herself to Avram to save her child. Like, she is an incredible hero of the Bible, and yet there's no other story about her. So, yeah, there's a whole alternative reading of that song, which I love to geek out on. Right, because <laughs> She already knew the, 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 the good, the mazal, right? That, that was coming to her. It's fantastic. So I, that, that's like the other part. So thank you. Uh, may this be in memory of my, my grandmother, plus memory, that brought us so much joy and also that. And I also want to give a shout out to the Menashe family, the Menashe Yohai family, which was my Sephardic. Uh, family growing up. I was very lucky because I had two best friends go growing up when I was in um, high school. One of them, even before that, one of them was Sephardic, the other was Misrahi, and I was the Ashkenazic. So I got to experience all of them. I would go to the Sephardic friend who, you know, they were family and, and we will sing in Ladino and have burekas and they will like speak with, well, the Misrahi we will include more Arabic words. They will say, Yuli, Aguam, this, that, we will say, Oive, and all this stuff. And the, so um, to me, that's how also I grew up with the blessing of knowing that there's not only one way of being Jewish. And I would love for our children and the next generations and actually the world, wake up world, hora de despertar, right? To uh -huh. know so we have a question from the from our viewers. They said, "What were the influences on Ladino music? Does it utilize Western style musical scales, or is it also influenced by Arabic makams or similar styles?" Thanks. Great question. Yes, it's heavily, heavily influenced by Arabic makams and styles. And in fact, 
wherever the Jews settled, they would be influenced by their neighbors, musically, rhythmically, um, melodically, linguistically. So, um, you know, certainly in Greece, they would be influenced by musical traditions that were prevalent in Greece at the time, in Turkey. Um, uh, depend, it really depended on, on where a community settled. But um, you can hear a lot of examples where folk songs can be traced to a different culture. And then the Ladino words, the Sephardim sort of put their own Ladino words on top of a song. So I think I mentioned um, a very sort of popular song called Hijamiya. So that was originally a Turkish folk song that then became a, a Sephardic song by using our own lyrics to that melody. So it's like the Maccabees, but way back when. Right. So it's very, it's, that was a very, very uh, common thing to do. Um, and uh, instruments, we were heavily influenced by the instruments around us. Um, you can actually really hear as Jews went from west, from Spain towards the east, the, the influences that were picked up along the way. Certain songs you really can hear sound more sort of Middle Eastern, more Arabic than, than other songs, which could sound more Western. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. I'm so glad that you're an expert on all this. Doesn't she only think about it and write books about it and children's books about it and children's music and, and, and she's <laughs> phenomenal in concert and an amazing, well, mensch for lack of a Latino word. <laughs> back up. But she also is an expert in all this. And, 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 I, and I was thinking as you were, you were sharing this, that not only Jewish people took from wherever they went, but they were also like pollinators, right? <laughs> bring sure. from one place to the other and bringing their own so this is about this yeah I the think intermingling of of cultures and you know one of the best Salonica, which i was talking about a lot of the non-jewish population spoke ladino because they were so influenced by the jewish population there it was such a huge population that in order to communicate with the jewish community Many people spoke Ladino who weren't even who weren't even Jewish. So um, there was this intermingling of of cultures and influences depending on where you lived. And I think that's also uh, answers a little bit of another question that we have: Was there a lot of exchanging of music between Sephardic subcultures, or was it mostly regionalized music, or both? I think as people traveled, right, they will. Absolutely. Although there are examples. So my family, being from Monastir, Monastir was landlocked, so we didn't have the same amount of um, interfacing with other cities. So um, we have a very interesting dialect and, and we use certain vowel raising, um, if you're into linguistics, that is different than the Ladino dialect that might be heard in Salonika, which was, um, which was in contact with a lot more cities and people because it was a port city. Um, they had French school. So they're, they're, depending on where you live, there may have been some more integration and interfacing. Um, but yes, in general, I would say certain songs that were popular in one region easily could have been heard in a different Ladino speaking region. It might have slight differences, um, but there were songs that you would be able to hear throughout the Mediterranean that would have commonalities. Thank you, Sarah. This has been fantastic. We talked history. We talked uh, pride in our heritage. We talked about diversity. We talked about music and musicality. Oh. We talked about <laughs> travel. We were invited to travel with you. Actually, you are organizing a travel. So I want yep. to know where to find you, where to find your amazing books and music. And there is a, a, a trip that you're organizing. I'm organizing a Sephardic food cruise it is going to be delicious it is going to be fascinating you're going to be singing with me you're going to be cooking with me and this most amazing fabulous chef susan barocas um you're going to be learning history and culture we're going to be stopping all along the aegean sea we're starting in athens we're ending in istanbul it's going to be amazing it's in may of 2023 all of that information and all of my books and music and children's programs, you can find it all right on my website, which um, is just my name, Sarah Aroesti, S-A-R-A-H, Aroesti, A-R-O-E-S-T-E.com. Thank you so much for being here today. And for everybody who's joining us, this has been such a pleasure and honor. And we hope that wherever you are, you took amazing 
um, advice and tips on how to to pass on your own er heritage to to your children and how to model that for them and and to talk to them whether you are familiar with Ladino or not about this amazing culture that that has thousands of years and and it's it's such an honor to be in the presence of someone who is living it again and helping others to relive it. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a joy to talk to you. I love your work. You keep on fighting the good fight too. And together we will all really, you know, we're, we're creating good in this world. And that's, you know, that's all we, all we can ask for, right? We have to all do better. We have to just bring joy and make sure our kids see that too. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody who is joining us today and uh, stay tuned for our next, we're gonna have a little break over Thanksgiving because everybody will be busy being thankful, hopefully, and not just about the turkey. And also we will have, we will um, come back again to Raising Jewish Kids on uh, the 30th of November with Naomi Les, which is an amazing uh, an educator, mother, uh, just a phenomenon, you know her. So, and, and just for you to know, no, we did not talk about what we're going to wear. I think we, <laughs> right? Red, so you can always count on that. <laughs> I don't know. I think Ladino and it's like red, the red just pops out. Maybe it's for Spain. I don't know. Just. Oh, I think so. But wait, before we go, I have to teach you how to say thank you before Thanksgiving. So thank you in Ladino for Thanksgiving. So there are two ways that we most often say it. One is merci mucho. <laughs> merci mucho. Merci mucho. And the other is muchas gracias. Okay, wait. First one is merci mucho. Mm -hmm. And the other? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. I'm going to pronounce that. Try to pronounce the R like you do. Gracias. <laughs> right? Yep. I'm perfect. trying. Okay, everybody. Thank you once again. Sarah, uh, you showed your books. I have the proof copy of mine. So exciting. Wait. I'm so excited. Yes, and it's all about uh, empowering children to explore spirituality and Jewish prayer. It's called Words from My Heart, the Hands on Jewish Prayer Book. Right here, it's very hands-on. And you can find more information at shalomif.com. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions. It's really great that you're there. And this conversation will be live. So don't worry if you had to miss a part of it or you are, were late for it. Thank you, Sarah. Have an awesome, awesome rest of your day. And buen Shabbat. Buen Shabbat. <laughs> you have said, merci mucho, muchas gracias. Buen Shabbat y adios. No, we don't really say that. No, we would say. Adio. Well, adio, it sounds oh. like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, so there's a very famous song, um, Adio Querida, which is like heart wrenching. Like, I never want to see you ever again. So like, we don't really say adios because <laughs> it's, it's like really, 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 really heavy. <laughs> Do you want to send us off with a little song? I'm putting you totally on the spot, but oh, I... oh gosh, uh, <laughs> I already did one. We did the Avram Avinu, so I'll leave you. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> okay. If you want, if you want to listen to more, go to Sarah's website. Go to I guess Spotify and all those good places where you can find her music. And we will see you next time. This is Evelyn Goldfinger, aka Missive, saying shalom. Bye bye. <laughs>